Welcome to this session on the inflammatory myopathies. In the previous session, we finished off our discussion of genetic muscular diseases, in which a gene mutation dictates a medical condition at birth. These included the muscular dystrophies, metabolic myopathies, and the more generic collection of muscular diseases simply classified as the congenital myopathies. We now turn our attention to the acquired myopathies. These are conditions that are typically acquired later in life, independent of gene mutation. Now, while some of these conditions may have a genetic component, meaning that some individuals may have a genetic predisposition for one of these diseases, there is no guarantee and anyone could theoretically be susceptible. It also means that for many of these conditions, treatment options are available. We'll begin our discussions with a look at the inflammatory myopathies. Now, as the name implies, these are acquired conditions with an inflammatory component that involves specific patterns of muscle weakness. We'll be looking in depth at three separate classes of inflammatory conditions, but for this first segment, we will start with a general discussion of the inflammatory myopathies, the challenges in making a diagnosis, and helpful strategies to differentiate these conditions from one another and other common diseases. The common thread for each of the inflammatory myopathies is a disease condition characterized by muscle weakness. Typically, it appears sometime in adulthood in which muscle tissue inflammation is noted upon muscle biopsy. As we will note in later segments, the precise location of this inflammation and inflammatory mediators, among other differences in presentation patterns, assist with the specific diagnosis of the condition. Although a few precipitating factors have been identified in patients with an inflammatory myopathy, the disease condition itself is relatively rare, and a specific cause, if one exists, has not been identified. One theory that has gained some attention is that the inflammatory myopathies are the result of an autoimmune disorder that targets skeletal muscle. This is in part based on the finding that individuals with inflammatory myopathies are also at a greater risk of developing other autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Certain forms of cancer may also trigger this condition in certain individuals. For the majority of patients, the initial presentation involves consistent and inexplicable muscular weakness that can either be gradual or rapid in onset. A number of other, more common conditions will be considered and rejected in making a diagnosis of an inflammatory myopathy, and so a number of tests may be ordered. For some of the inflammatory myopathies, there may be an increase in resting plasma creatine kinase levels, although this finding is not universal. Studies have also found elevations in antibodies that give support to the theory of an autoimmune trigger to some forms of the disease. If an MRI is ordered, it may identify regions of inflammation surrounding affected muscle. Abnormal EMG findings are highly sensitive for inflammatory myopathies. The specific findings are beyond the scope of the present conversation, but help to identify patterns of muscle involvement and possible sites for muscle biopsy, which are required to make a diagnosis of an inflammatory myopathy. While the workup and testing for inflammatory myopathies are relatively straightforward, the diagnosis itself can be difficult. This is due to the fact that inflammatory myopathies are uncommon and that the initial presentation shows similarities to a number of other more common muscle diseases. Occam's razor dictates that the simplest solution is most likely the right one. Put another way, if you're in Texas and you hear hoofbeats behind you, when you turn around, expect horses and not zebras. This assists physicians with focusing in on the correct diagnosis more quickly and efficiently. The problem is, every so often, a zebra does appear. The inflammatory myopathies fall into this category, and a failure to recognize inflammatory myopathies when they do appear leads to delays in diagnosis and worsening of the conditions and increased suffering without proper treatment. While ordering a barrage of complex and expensive tests in the hunt for a zebra may not be a realistic solution, there are a number of tests that can be performed on routine blood work that should be considered with cases of nonspecific muscle weakness that may help physicians to consider or reject an inflammatory myopathy diagnosis. As previously mentioned, elevations of creatine kinase as well as aldolase are an indication of muscle disease, 
and include many, but not all, of the inflammatory myopathies. A CBC may identify inflammatory markers, which may also indicate the presence of an inflammatory myopathy. As previously discussed, the inflammatory myopathies can be associated with autoimmune disorders. Detection of antinuclear antibodies or rheumatoid factor may allow physicians to hone in on the inflammatory myopathies. In contrast, blood tests showing abnormalities in electrolyte balance, anemia, or thyroid function may lead physicians to consider other causes of muscle weakness. A common cause of muscle weakness is electrolyte imbalances, which are easily identified through blood work. Similarly, vitamin D deficiencies may indirectly indicate irregularities in calcium homeostasis, another cause of general fatigue and muscle weakness. Significant findings related to electrolyte imbalance should direct physicians away from the inflammatory myopathies as a possibility whereas elevation in these other markers indicate that inflammatory myopathies should remain in the differential diagnosis. While the presence of antinuclear antibodies and rheumatoid factor are typically positive with the inflammatory myopathies, there are a few other more common autoimmune disorders affecting muscle tissue which must also be taken into account. One of these is myasthenia gravis, an autoimmune disorder affecting acetylcholine receptors in the motor end plate and is discussed further in your neurology talks. In the case of myasthenia gravis, the presentation pattern is distinct. The patient presents with weakness that most commonly affects the facial muscle and which worsens throughout the day. These findings are highly indicative for myasthenia gravis, whereas the inflammatory myopathies do not commonly affect the facial muscles and improve throughout the day. Further tests can confirm the diagnosis. Similar to myasthenia gravis, Lambert-Eaton syndrome is autoimmune disorder targeted to the neuromuscular junction, but in this situation, it is calcium channels that are targeted. The presentation pattern is similar to that for the inflammatory myopathies, although facial muscle involvement may still be observed. One of the distinguishing factors is that creatine kinase levels are not typically elevated in this patient population. Further diagnostic tests specific to Lambert-Eaton syndrome should confirm this diagnosis. The presentation pattern for inflammatory myopathies closely resembles another condition we have previously talked about, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, in that both conditions affect the proximal musculature of both upper and lower appendages. One distinguishing feature is the later onset of symptoms in patients with an inflammatory myopathy. Muscle biopsies will generally be taken, in particular if diagnosis is not fully confirmed, which as we will see, will allow for a definitive diagnosis. In a later session, we'll be discussing toxic myopathies, which are muscle diseases that result from chemical substances which are toxic to muscle tissue. This can be an intended effect, which is the case with certain animal venoms. It may also be an unwanted side effect of certain medications. While presentation may have some similarities to inflammatory myopathies, the patient history should lead to the identification of a precipitating factor for the diagnosis of a toxic myopathy. Another distinct class are the infective myositis myopathies, which result from an identifiable infectious agent. This class of diseases has many pathological similarities to the inflammatory myopathies, but typically present with an acute onset accompanied by systemic symptoms such as fever. Again, we will briefly review these diseases in a later session. Finally, ameliotrophic lateral sclerosis is a lower motor neuron disease that can also mimic symptoms of inflammatory myopathies. Because of the prevalence and severity of ALS, this will likely be a principal focus during the initial phases of the differential diagnosis. Lab results would be normal for ALS, which would likely lead to nerve conduction studies and needle electromyography. Once ALS is ruled out, muscle biopsies would be warranted, which would allow for a definitive diagnosis of inflammatory myopathy. That concludes this overview of the inflammatory myopathies. In the next segment, we'll focus our attention on the first of three identified types of inflammatory myopathy, polymyositis.